Data Thanks. rock star. Well, I, you know, the problem of talking about data, it, it feels a little bit like being Marilyn Monroe's fifth husband. I know what to do, I don't know how to make it interesting. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I spent 15 years working for Mayors Giuliani, Dinkins, and New York, and Nagan, and New Orleans. And the one thing that we always did wrong was we'd make a campaign promise and say, let's do this, and then let's go through the data afterwards to make to rationalize why we did this, and that this never worked. And an example of that was in New Orleans East after Hurricane Katrina. And the folks in New Orleans East said, you know, we, we, what we, we want our neighborhood is a, is a, a, a Ruby Tuesday. And Nagin and I went out there and said, we, we don't get it. We want a Ruby Tuesday. But it turned out that's where all the, the defense contractors were. And we couldn't put, move professional services out there, the lawyers, the accounts, because they didn't know where to take their, their clients to lunch. And so they inherently knew what they wanted, but they didn't have the data to attract the restaurant. So it wasn't about Ruby Tuesday, it was about trying to build a, an economy. And one of the things I worked, went to work for Social Compact, which was a, it's a think tank that came out of the federal regulatory community, specifically the FDIC and the OCC, was that when you get down to the community level, we can all count the population of Florida. We get down to what those Lehigh Acres look like today. We don't get it right very often. And that's why Lehigh, Lehigh Acres is very underserved from a, a, a social service perspective. And my friend you know, Carson will tell you how underserved Hendry County is from a social service perspective. Lee County has over 2,000 not-for-profits. Glade County has 13. 13 not-for-profits. Zero grocery stores. One library branch. So from a educator's perspective, from an economic development perspective, from it, you name it, they don't have what they need to rebuild more hay. And you know, Carson and his team here, we had a great conversation about how do we get Sanibel to partner better with Cluiston to create an east-west you know, communication strategy rather than an I-75 communication strategy. And that's, that's why I'm interested in this, is because if you go out through you know, State Road 80, which will, uh, thank God, be uh, four lane uh, by December, and State Road 82 will, be, will begin the four landing. We're going to have an economy that goes east west. And Carson can tell you about the investments that Monsanto are making, and Light's brothers, and Hilliard brothers, and others. But if you're on if you're on if you're on Sanibel, and I have the pleasure of owning five, or shouldn't be five restaurants, <laughs> four restaurants, but shouldn't be five restaurants on Sanibel. We live in a very rarefied world. We just had an analysis done of our venture capital potential in Sanibel. We have 861 families who have discretionary income of a million dollars or more, annual income of a million dollars or more. That's $861 million of annual income. We just created 25 new family trusts last year, but they're in Minneapolis, or they're in Cleveland, or they're in somewhere else. They're not here. And what the real point of what we want to do is how do we introduce a data platform, a data communication structure, so that we have a better way of identifying where the real need is. So that when we raise money on Sanibel, Melissa Congress is one of our best fundraisers on Sanibel, and a dear friend. <laughs> um, but that the money, we also raise money for Hendry, or for the needs in Collier, or Charlotte, or wherever the need is. And how do we identify those needs? We went right for our love social compact. We did an analysis from Mayor Diaz, um, of the pleasure of being in San as his senior advisor. <coughs> what was the population of Miami? In 2000, the census told the population was, two, was uh, 364,000 people. We found 508,000 people in Miami and a missed income of $30 billion. And when we were able to put that into the risk analysis for what uh, uh, the different risk, risk uh, modeling companies did, it changed the cost of capital. So it starts with that. And also, by the way, for every person missed by the census, and, and our county manager is doing a great job of making sure that we get our census right here in Lee, that for every person missed by the census, we, miss, we lose $2,000 of, of federal funds. So when you pick, pick up another 100,000 people in, in Dade County or Miami, that's another $100 million. So data matters. It matters how we price capital, it matters how we address social issues, it matters what we get we're entitled to from the federal government. So regionalism becomes not just how what does Sanibel fit into Lee County, but how does Sanibel and Bonita and Henry and Cluiston or Cluiston and LaBelle, how they all fit in together. And you need the data to tell the story. There's a narrative that you have to start with. And we don't throw that narrative, we miss, this, miss the point when we go back to the I-75 North-South strategy. 
So what we're trying to develop is a platform where you're going to be able, if you're a graduate student at Edison or a nursing student at FGCU, you're going to be able to look at the relationship between foreclosures and domestic violence. You're going to be able to look at the same data in the same GIS lens. You're going to be able to look at what's the trending of the improvement associations, like Pine Matter or Page Field or, or Pomona. How, how's crime trending in those communities? And what, are, what is the impact when we do have to invest this into this kind of strategy? What is the impact? You're going to be able to go down and look at this at a census block level. So it's not just about what does Lee County look like, but what does you know, the census block around Summerlin look like? And so when you decide where do you want to buy a home, or where you want to enroll your kids into school, what does our neighborhood look like? And how do we, you know, we, then if we can really get fancy and we, we'll add hedonic pricing models onto this amazing analysis, we can do a predictive modeling, so we can, what will our neighborhood look like if we build a new public park? Or we build a grocery store to address the food, the, the food desert? What is the relationship with obesity and the lack of access to full, you know, full service grocery in the Lehigh Acres? There's a relationship. The further you go into the center part of the state, the more obese we become. The closer we live to food, uh, to food production, the more obese we become. It's called resource curse. But why is that and how do we address that? Data has to tell you the answer. And you can't start with, you know what, I have an intuition, this is what I want, and I'm gonna go grab the data. We have to start with, we have a regional, a region here that is five counties, and Hendry and Glaze are just as important as Charlotte and Lee and Collier, and then we gotta start moving things. We're gonna have a regatta. We're gonna take 100 boats from Sanibel to, to Cluiston, just so that we start a conversation between Sanibel and Cluiston. But the data also connects us every day. It's our tax base, it's our health system, it's our education system, it's our workforce. Our restaurants, our restaurants most of our employees come out from Lehigh Acres. They drive a long way to get a job where you're not making a whole bunch of money. And we've got to improve that, but it starts with the data. And so this platform is going to be an opportunity to display the data, to make it available to our communities, to our households, to our institutions, but also for our investors, for those 861 families in Sanibel who may want to create a foundation but don't know anything about where they want to put that money other than they know someone on a board of somewhere. We want to rationalize it, and then we want to be able to measure it. So that we can come back to everyone and say, we reduced childhood obesity. We reduced it. We can't tell you today. The, no one can tell you today what we reduced. The Ford, I had a meeting with the Ford Foundation. They have spent $300 billion over the last 50 years, and they can't tell you what impact they have had. That's astounding. And if the Ford Foundation can't do it, what, are we gonna, what, what can I do? I mean, I, I can't tell you anything about the impact I've had. But, so we have to, they, so they're on an initiative, a kick, to start measuring. And with me, I'm really happy, we, we have a great team put together. It was led by Lisa Hyder, who's really the, our operational director for our, the, the, the research section of this, this effort. And Susie Mertz, who comes here, had the experience from Walt, at Walt Disney World, and has done marketing research for, you know, for corporations around the country. And De Dan Beverly, who's worked for mayors in Louisville and the Collins Center. So what we're really happy about for the first time, and Dave and I have this conversation all the time, is. We're not the, you know, usually the, the, the expert, the consultant is the guy who comes in from the airport with a suit on. We live here. And so we're doing this because we want to stay here, we want to invest in here, we want to make a difference here. And joining with, with Sarah and Don Marie, we think we have the opportunity, but it, it's not a sexy topic in everyone, even in our restaurants. We don't go with, you know, our, we don't look at the data every day about making sure, you know, what we're investing in. But we need to. And when we especially when we decide to invest in kids, or public health, or in education, or in economic development, you gotta start with the data, because if you don't, we're gonna waste a whole lot of money. And then, you know, I, I, I step out of Congressional Subcommittee. That, we know what's coming down the, the, down the pipe. We know what cuts are coming. We know what CDBG might look like in two years. And we have to be prepared today on how to be best positioned to cover any kind of cuts, but at the same time, continue to keep making investments in vital services. And that's really what this project is about, is how do we make the investment into the capacity of organizations so they have the ability to meet their missions. And it'll be their business to what their mission is going to be. It's going to be their, their, their business on what best to do. But how do we, not just with the money, how do we position, you know, we we're talking about Steve and Lori, how do we, you know, uh, uh, position the accounting community? How do we position the legal community? How do you position the professional service community? So they're all in the best place and in the best position to help maximize uh, what we can get out of our not-for-profit sector. 
And that's really what I think the, the hope of this project is, and it's just a pleasure to be part of it. It's a data guy, right? He's got all the ins and outs on data. Um, he talked a lot about how he's going to call, uh, how he's going to uh, use the data, but I want to be sure that we hit on to what kind of data we're collecting and how we're going to do it. Uh, because again, we're not in this alone. We're going to have a lot of informational seminars with a lot of different sectors, particularly in the not-for-profit world. The one thing that we want to walk out here communicating is we're doing, we're measuring and assessing capacity to bring funding in not to take funding away. And sometimes this is not a capacity study. This is not, and I put it in quotes, a needs assessment. This is for to give us the information to really rally and bring more resources in and build the capacity. So informational seminars will be, will be coupled with these capacity surveys and then roundtable follow-ups. Because when John first started talking to me and Lisa and the entire team began talking to both uh, Ann Douglas, our director of programs, who's on the team, and Jacqueline Ehlers uh, here at the foundation, you know, we said, hey, at the end of this, we're going to know more, but how will it help us do more? How will it help us care more? How will it help us invest more? Because data without the second D, which is what? Dialogue. Dialogue really, really doesn't strike the right note. So a big part of you being involved and being here is around the dialogue because the data can only tell us so much. The data can tell us where the needs are, where the gaps are, how we can uh, work together to solve issues, but really the dialogue is really what brings the data to life. So as we move forward on this, that's going to be a big part of what we want to do because without the dialogue, how are we going to show investors what the issue of, issues are? The GIS mapping won't do that. The people who are experts in the field will do that. Then we're going to show them what are the best models available in our region, and then we're going to uh, really work together to create collective impact moving forward. And the reason I think most of you agree to be a part of this is really for the third D. Because what the data brings us, along with the dialogue, is that ability to make the decisions that we as funders and capacity builders all want to make. It's really dealing with that issue, like at Wells Fargo, is your phone ringing off the hook? You know, a lot of not-for-profit organizations are calling making those requests. How, how do you regionally know? How do you know those decisions? How do you know the money's making the impact? So we really want to make sure that everything we do, both along the lines of data and dialogue, really lead to those decisions that we need. Now, how are we going to talk to each other? If I promised you that you only have to come to one meeting, what does that look like? How are we going to stay in touch with each other? Well, you're going to get calls from both the consultants, the foundation, and other uh, members of the team to say, hey, we've got this issue. We think you're really addressing it. Will you get together with us? We're going to have webinars, <coughs> roundtable discussions, but you're not going to get called to every meeting because in, in some cases, we don't all need to sit around and talk about the issue. We need to move forward together. Um, we're going to pass a piece of paper around right now. If you'll just put your name and make sure that we've got your email. We've already set up a, it's a wiki, but it's a website. Dan Beverly's the expert in this. And uh, Dan and Lisa will communicate with you tomorrow via email on how to log on to the website. We will be continually setting up information on that website um, that you can check into. We'll send you an alert when something new has been posted. It allows us to dialogue. It's a private website, so only the members of the advisory council can get on there. So we'll be talking to each other, and we hope that you'll communicate back with us in the same way. When you learn something, if you hear a not-for-profit in your region maybe is facing their doors closing, or you hear about a project that we could put portfolio um, funding together and get organizations together, this is going to take a lot of interaction between all of us to make this work. You know, we're establishing an information platform. That won't be launched till December. We don't want to wait to start sharing information. John will give you in, uh, updates on how the GIS mapping is going, and it allows us to continue to talk to each other. But I called you all here not just to listen to all of us talk. I wanted to give a few minutes if you all had any questions, if you wanted to provide us any feedback. We've been videotaping, but at this time we'll turn the videotape off so you feel like you can ask a question and not feel like you'll be caught on tape. No, not at all. Um, 